So, it, were you going to lead off uh, the yeah. testimony? Yes. Yeah. Um, if any of you other folks want to come in, you're more than welcome. Who's that? Sure. Well, yeah. If we, if you can find a seat in our big room. <laughs> Yeah, come on in, Bethany. We got some. Everybody knows who you are. <laughs> yeah. There's a chair behind the door, too. And then we go that way. And you yeah. sit right on that. I can see it if it's on the island. No. You can sit here. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. So, um. In the other room. Eventually, we, if we're lucky, real lucky, we may get a bigger room in another year. <laughs> and, I need some kind of magic spell but, to make this bigger. But I'm not going to bet the fire on yeah. <laughs> i got to get my Hermione powers. Did you make it? Just barely. Yeah. Thank you. Um, to, um, <coughs> It's uh, really great so many of you could come down today and, and be with us uh, for a few minutes at least. Uh, and uh, just quickly, I think we'll run around and introduce ourselves and then we'll get started and make the most of what we time we have. Ryan Collimore from the Rutland District. Ruth Hardy from the Addison District. And I'm Bobby Starr from Essex Orleans County. Chris Pearson from Chipman County. Anthony, Anthony Plater from Washington County. So, uh, again, welcome. And John, we're, uh, we'll let you get started Great. and uh, and get the show on the road. Okay, all right, well, thank you. Uh, thank you for your time this morning. My name is John Ramsey. I'm the Executive Director at the Center for an Agricultural Economy in Hardwick. We're a nonprofit organization working to improve food systems for our community and bring viability to farms in our region and other parts of the state. Um, I was just going to touch on a little bit of the work that we do and then hand over uh, the testimony to Ben Notterman, um, and I'll introduce Ben a little bit more after. Um, but um, at the Center for Ag Economy, we have a number of programs and enterprises that are designed to help the community um, come together around food and education and farm viability. Um, we own and operate uh, the Vermont Food Venture Center, which is a shared use facility. We have about 20 or 25 farms and food businesses that use that facility, and they come as far away from Chittenden County, the Northeast Kingdom, Franklin County, Central Vermont, and uh, Upper Valley, and, and use that facility. Uh, when someone comes into that facility, not only do they have a safe working environment and a safe uh, commercial kitchen space, they also have uh, food um, safety um, from our facilities manager, they have production uh, assistance, they have business uh, training, and they have market uh, marketing assistance. Um, our community programs, Bethany Dunbar is our community programs manager. Um, she manages Atkins Field, which is a green space in the middle of Hardwick. It's the host of the Hardwick Farmers Market, and there's a number of programs that we do there uh, focused around food access and education and connecting the community to agriculture, which is something we feel is extremely important for agriculture moving forward into the future. We also have a farm institution program, uh, which provides uh, fresh local produce to a number of our larger institutions around the state and out of Vermont, actually. Um, we sourced about 140,000 pounds of raw um, produce from Vermont growers all over Vermont, Champlain Valley, Northeast Kingdom, Chittenden County, other places this year. We minimally process that product in our facility and prepare it for use in commercial and, and institutional kitchens, uh, like I said, around Vermont and New England. Can you um, store that right on site? You have that much? We store the raw product on site, and then we basically, it's called, the, the program is called Just Cut, so literally that's what it means, is we process that product and it goes out the door. We, we want to deliver that product fresh to the institution so they can take that, you know, chopped cabbage or diced beets or, you know, peeled potatoes and use it right in their institutional kitchens with minimal labor, and it's creating a supply chain in a market that otherwise wouldn't exist for our Vermont producers. We recently purchased a business called Farm Connects, which is a cold chain delivery service. Yeah. And um, that service is providing um, 
basically pick up and delivery for a number of Vermont producers, about 60 producers use that service. Um, we are actually working with Greg Cox down in Rutland. He actually just visited our facility last week with a number of people from Rutland, from the school and the town or, or the city. Um, and also we're working with um, other food hubs around the state to basically connect, uh, create connections and markets for, um, for farmers that otherwise, again, wouldn't exist. Um, that service moves about three and a half million in local farm products to uh, markets for farmers around the state. It delivers to 200 stores and institutions and restaurants in and around Vermont and outside of Vermont. And like I said, we're working with other food hubs to get product down to Brattleboro and other places so it can be pushed out into other parts of, of New England. Uh, Vermont Farm Fund is another enterprise that we operate. Um, last year we made almost $400,000 in loans to farmers, business builder loans and emergency loans to sort of respond to uh, issues that come up on farms for farms and food businesses. Um, I guess I'll leave it there and we'll leave some time for questions at the end. And again, this is uh, Ben Notterman. Yeah. Hi, Ben. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for your time today. We yeah. really appreciate it. So uh, I'm owner and manager, uh, co-owner and manager of Snug Valley Farm in Hardwick. We produce uh, grass-fed and grass-finished beef, as well as pasture-grown heritage pork. Uh, I'm in partnership with my, my parents, and we're in the successional generation successional process, which is quite a quite an undertaking. Um, so annually, we're finishing about uh, right now 80, 80 to 100 beef a year, and somewhere in the neighborhood of four to 500 pigs. Um, we have a land base of just under 300 acres, always in the market for more, uh, or picking up more ground. Um, so uh, I guess we are very lucky to be where we are here in, in, in Hardwood being in the Northeast Kingdom. Uh, it's kind of like a moving and shaking spot as far as agriculture goes. Uh, I, I feel like we're on the, on the leading edge of, of developing these markets like John was talking about with the CAE and, and moving forward and pushing our product out. So um, I guess a couple things uh, from, from, a, from a farmer standpoint and from an ag standpoint that uh, have been really beneficial are uh, services like Farm Connects. We're, my farm is a, a client of Farm Connects. Uh, we move fresh product weekly from uh, slaughterhouse and processor to its end destination. Um, yeah, we're just uh, we're very excited to be where we are and we're, we're actually very lucky to be uh, in Hardwick. Uh, Hardwick, as you know, has grown up quite a lot in the last 20 years from where it was. Uh, so we're kind of like in the, in the heart of, of uh, this movement. Uh, from, an, from an ag standpoint, uh, I know some of the, some of the points were, uh, what, what could the state, uh, how, how does the state help, or how could the state help uh, farmers uh, <clears throat> advance from where we are? Uh, I see a lot of great programs here, uh, like the, the Water Quality BMP program, which we went through this past year. We built some manure stack pads to, to improve our water quality on our farm. Um, one of the glaring things I see as uh, a need in the ag world is farm succession planning. I think that is drastically, drastically lacking. There's a lot of great service providers out there, like the services that CAE offers or uh, Farm viability, which is a program we've gone through yeah. for business planning, we put that together yep. quite a few years ago. That really shaped our business and pushed us to where we are now. But mm -hmm. uh, as we're going through the succession planning and transition process, there are some severe gaps. And if if there could be a some help in that world, I think that would uh, do two things. Uh, it would help increase our our workforce development of younger folks wanting to to come into agriculture if there are tools to help. Um, the succession process, and it will also uh, help our smaller farms survive so they don't necessarily have to just shutter and, and close up, uh, that there's a plan for the next step. Um, where, are, are we going to questions? I sure. was just going to, where would be the best place to house something like that? That's a very think? good question. <laughs> um, there's a number of service providers. So yeah. the, the Center for Ag Economy, we're a member of VHB's Farm Viability Service Network. Mm -hmm. And there's a number of service providers within that network that have the capacity to do one-on-one -on -one direct assistance to farmers uh, for succession planning. 
the the issue is there's just not enough of them, exactly. and and yeah. so um, I think that, that that they could be housed in a number of different organizations like ours or the Intervale Center. You know, they're already doing a lot of that work as well. Uh, other organizations. Uh, there's also a number of private individuals who also work through the farm viability program and uh, contract through the farm viability program. So I don't know if it needs to be housed specifically in one location as much as like resources around it so that there's increased capacity. Okay. So, um, kind of lost my train. Sorry. Of no, 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 that's perfectly <laughs> quite all right. Uh, so some of the other uh, great tools that are out there are, uh, that, that have helped our operation have been uh, like the Ranching for Profit School, which was brought here by the Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund and the Vermont Farm to Plate Network last year. So uh, beefing up the already robust service providers with like a, a different aspect or a different look at the same stuff uh, has been a real help uh, for our business and it's really pushed us more, you know, further into the uh, profitability and sustainability of a long-term business. Um, any, anything else, Ben? Uh, do, you, <laughs> do you sell all of your eighty beef and your four hundred pigs? Uh, Yes. Through that network? Mm, uh, sort of. Uh, we, we market a lot of beef, uh, about 25 beef a year, direct to consumer through farmers markets, uh, uh, buyers clubs, direct to consumer sales at the farm. We wholesale uh, roughly 250 to 300 pigs a year to different accounts like Hunger Mountain Co op, to online farmers markets in Boston, uh, to butcher shops and restaurants in the Burlington, Waterbury area. And then we also finish about 70 for our direct-to-consumer. Uh, so it, it really, it varies. And, That's yeah. quite a little business. So. It's a lot to manage. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and what slaughterhouse do you have? We actually use three slaughterhouses at the moment. Uh, Bros in Troy, we yeah. use uh, Northeast Kingdom in St. Johnsbury, Lindenville Business Park, and then we also use in New Hampshire, PT Farm, even though they're just over the river. But uh, it really depends on where the where the product's going as to which slaughterhouse you're going to use. take over that part. Anything else? Yeah, Ben, um, so your animals are grazing, I'm assuming, right? Yes, they are. Largely. Um, are you, have you been following the payment for ecosystem service discussion. Like the, through the like the FAP grants? Well, <laughs> that's a good question. They're coming at it from a lot of different okay. ways, but we set up, and this committee was part of this last year, an attempt to um, get our arms around it here in Vermont. And it, it's uh, part of why I'm curious about it is a lot of it has been aimed at some of the water quality work. So mm -hmm. it's been more uh, sort of Champlain Valley focused um, but the idea is farms like yours that are basically in a regenerative practice um, you know maybe there'd be a way for us to hire farmers to build soils basically and, and um, you know we're that discussion here is in its infancy but um, I was just curious if that sort of percolated around your region where I th there I are all, a lot of innovators out there sure uh, but but I think even going to that point is uh, farmers don't necessarily want that kind of help from from the state government. If you helped us find more markets for our products outside of the state, that would let us do the uh, magnify those practices that we're already doing to a greater extent, and then we can push the Vermont product further out, not you know beyond our borders. I mean, there is definitely uh, uh, some need for like the direct to farmer assistance like that to get them to kind of change their their uh, paradigm but where the farms that have already made that shift right. just expanding the market share would be a great help okay very good yeah, what I would just add to that is say that uh, market development there's there's marketing support and then there's also market development marketing support is something that a lot of farmers need in order to move their product to uh, consumers market development is something that as a state I think that we can invest in uh, together and that's kind of what Ben is talking about in terms of developing markets in and around Vermont and sort of you know peeling back the next layer of consumers that we are not already reaching and so making connections like I was talking about before getting product from the Northeast Kingdom to Rutland County to Addison County outwards to, to Brattleboro are all initiatives um, that, that we want to focus on 
One other thing that we wanted to talk to you a little bit about today, and I don't see Andy Keeler here from Jasper Hill Farm, is the Yellow Barn Business Accelerator um, project that's happening in Hardwick. And Sean Fielder, um, the Hardwick Town Manager, is here. And uh, in Andy's place, Sean, could you please just talk about the accelerator uh, project and the state support of that project and um, how that sort of uh, piece of infrastructure can help us in the farm economy world? Yeah, for the record, I'm uh, Sean Fielder. I'm the town manager for the town of Hardwick. Uh, John, thanks for mentioning the Yellow Barn and um, uh, Business Accelerator. So the Yellow Barn uh, Business Accelerator it's actually the Yellow Barn Business Accelerator and Corporate Campus to put the full name to this project. It's been in the works for about three years now. The uh, objective is to renovate the uh, what was the former Greensboro Garage, which was on Route 15, um, right on the west end of Hardwick, and then add uh, accelerator space, um, which is a, a large industrial facility at the same location. So we've had a significant amount of uh, public-private uh, partnership work on this this past couple of years. What we're honed in on right now is uh, securing our final grant support and uh, so everybody is aware this is an 8.6 million dollar project we have uh, we have secured support from um, Vermont uh, uh, the VCD uh, sorry there's so many acronyms these days yeah. Vermont, community. The Vermont Community Development Program thank you John <laughs> they've actually uh, offered up a $900,000 grant the uh, town of Hardwick has put money on the table we've received money from NBRC to date for land purchase uh, we are waiting to hear from uh, Economic Development Administration on a three million dollar grant ask uh, I want to just commend uh, Department of Ag and Agency of Commerce and Community Development. They've been, been providing a significant amount of support on this project this past year and a half, uh, navigating everything that has to do with our permitting processes at state, local, and federal level, and then also securing the additional grant support that I have mentioned. Um, the, the good news is that at this phase, um, we have two committed partners to the project. This is public information. We have uh, Cabot uh, committed to take over the entire Yellow Burn space when that's rehabbed. This will be a retail space, so if you're familiar with the retail space out of Waterbury as an example, um, this will be an entire retail space for them to showcase their product and, wear, uh, and show other Vermont ag related products. And then uh, Jasper Hill, uh, John has mentioned Jasper Hill, they're actually going to be uh, expanding their business, they're going to be taking over this accelerator space. This is not insignificant, it's a 22,000 foot square facility, which is basically adding additional cave space to uh, increase what Jasper Hill is gonna have for their production. And then uh, related to this, we're gonna have some additional uh, remaining retail space uh, for other uh, entities that wanna get in on this. Um, you know, the food economy in Hardwick is not new. Uh, you know, some of you probably know the New York Times article from a number of years ago that uh, Hardwick's the town that saved, saved the food economy. I mean, that was the tagline. So we're trying to expand upon that. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we're trying. I, I commented earlier about, um, I want everybody to understand this. You know, our perspective is obviously the things we're talking about now are going to be advantageous to the town of Hardwick. But if we can, we're helping our neighbors. We're helping everybody, not just in the Northeast Kingdom, but we're going to those state boundaries as well. Mm -hmm. The, the agricultural economy, you all know this, this is your committee, this is really important for us. And the way I thought about this, you got the next generation sitting across the table right there. We're helping advance and support what it is he's trying to do. Obviously he's successful, Ben's successful at what he's doing. That's the intent with this Yellow Barn Business Accelerator. We want to offer a space where businesses can expand, bring the next generation along, have positive economic uh, benefit in this food and forest uh, industry. So it's not lost in some of my commentary now. The, we've done some basic economic analysis of the Yellow Barn project and with it completed, we still have a number of steps to go on our permitting and securing our grant funding. At a five year period, the, the uh, REMI model, which is one of the economic models that ACCD helped us with, predicts 110 jobs and $8.1 million of personal income put back into the community at the five-year phase. This is really significant for our state. You know, it's a positive trend. Ancillary but related, we're right next to the LVRT. 
And the rail trail, that's a whole different subject, but anything we can be doing on that rail trail to continue to bring people to Vermont and see these activities and experience this, it's a positive upward trend. Yeah. So there's a couple of things for you. Your plate's pretty rounded up. Yeah, <laughs> some days it's falling off the edge. <laughs> it's a correct statement. But we have good partners in Skate and, and many other people. I, I didn't mention everybody that's been helping us on these processes. Uh, I'd be remiss to not mention uh, NBDA. Um, you know, Alice Lowe and Dave Seneca have been doing just gangbuster amount of support for us. Yeah. And uh, that's been you know, really advantageous. We do have a, a Department of Ag contact that's involved with us. And we are, we are getting the support from the higher ups, whether it's commissioner level or secretary level. They're, they're behind the positives you know, that we're seeing on this project. So you know, anything that the senators here can do to help us would be greatly appreciated. Yeah, a rising, a rising tide lifts all boats. So, yeah, that's you know, we for sure. To start the groundswell. We, yeah. we, are, we are collaborators. We can't do all this work on our own. There's a number of great organizations and people and municipalities and businesses that hopefully this Yellow Barn project can sort of be a model for in terms of like bringing those private businesses, municipalities, and nonprofits together to move a project forward. Um, so I think we have about five minutes left, and Tom Gilbert from Black Dirt Farm, uh, our last testifier, has I just, just arrived. I have a quick question yeah. before you move on. Yeah. Uh, we're talking about the basic processing that you do for any institutions, shopping and whatnot. Is there any talk about putting together a freezing facility so we could freeze for the amount of vegetables and use more people? Like an individual quick frozen yeah. line, something like that? Yeah. You know, I think we're, we're, doing a, we're doing a lot of research and development on a number of different products right now, including some more frozen products for institutions. And that's a goal of ours in that program to sort of understand what we can do and what sort of price points we can hit uh, for those institutional markets. And we'll have a lot more on that in this coming year. Um, and so I think that we'll have a better understanding of what the infrastructure needs will be around that in the future. But I know like Western Mass Processing has a big individual pick frozen facility um, that they can run through large amounts of uh, I mean, we yeah. that supply institutions right. more year round vegetables. Exactly. Mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah. yeah. We'll give it to Tom. Okay. I apologize for being late. I've actually was early and I've been sitting with Carolyn Partridge for the last 45 minutes and That's didn't realize the, I was uh, in the wrong room. Up there late <laughs> in your wrong like your time. <laughs> okay, I, was, I got a lot of legislative gossip. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. So I, uh, I was uh, running out the door, so I only had one, a chance to print one copy, Linda, but if um, I can submit the, some written testimony, I can pass this around right now. Um, and I can supply an electronic copy if that's better for you. Um, so I think I'm familiar with many of you. Yeah, uh, good to see you again. Back. Yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah. Um, and thank you in advance for uh, taking up Anthony's bill um, uh, to uh, 65 on the poultry foraging. Um, my name is Tom Gilbert. I'm with Black Deer Farm. Uh, I also play a number of other roles. I sit on a number of uh, boards in the Northeast Kingdom. Not specifically, I represent the town of Standard on the Northeast Kingdom Waste Management Board. So I see this from a variety of angles. Uh, I moderate for the town of Standard. I coach elementary school soccer. Um, I'm pretty active throughout. I was a long time board member with the Center for Ag Economy. Um, and it's with all of those hats that I'm, kind of, I'm coming in today and specifically supporting the, the 265 um, bill because um, I think what is the most concerning thing that I'll try to highlight in, in my testimony right now is we, we appear to be having the, a problem with agencies working at cross purposes and in the wake of that, um, we're undermining the very successes that we're actually having as a state and those are the actual successes that aren't just helping us address the issues of today. But if we're serious about reorganizing as a society around issues like global warming and hunger and water quality, we have to start innovating and thinking beyond traditional boundaries. So there are three fundamental problems that, I, that we're facing that I'll try to unpack without it making it confusing. Anthony's bill addresses one of those. Uh, but just two seconds on our farm, just so you have a little bit of a better sense of who we are. We're in standard Vermont just nine miles northeast of Hardwick. How long drives that from here? From here? Yeah. 45 to an hour, depending on who you get behind. Can we do a field trip there? Yeah. Please, yeah. absolutely. Nice. I would love to do that. <laughs> yeah, we had offered that earlier, and right, right. it felt like it was kind of far away, and but uh, more than happy to do that. Uh, 
And I think one of the things you'd see when you come to our place is that we have a what I would call an integrated operation as opposed to purely diversified. So our farm model is designed to follow carbon through the food system the way that carbon would otherwise move through an ecosystem. And we have all, um, we try to capture uh, value and um, create value along the way um, each, of, each of those stops. So we go off of the farm, we collect discarded food in the region, uh, schools, institutions, businesses. We do about 30 tons of food a week. Um, we deliver to two other operations and then we bring about half of that or a little more than half of that back to our farm each week. We make a compost blend that we uh, forage our lane hens on. It's an attempt to mimic uh, the ancestor of those hens, the, the Indonesian red jungle fowls eating habits, uh, much like farmers, dairy farmers are, uh, and, and beef growers are trying to get back to grass fed operations. Uh, what we don't what the hens don't forage, we have <coughs> with, we add value with, uh, and then a portion of that we have further value and make worm castings out of, and then we grow about 50 acres of hay, um, and we grow hemp for the CBD market, and then tomatoes and salad greens for our local produce market. Um, I employ eight people, um, it works out to a little less than six FTE a year, um, and then three seasonal part-time people. Um, we pay living wages, we don't pay minimum wages, um, and we are doing the work that we're doing because we think we actually need solutions at this point. We're not just interested in having a cool, viable business that allows us to pat ourselves on the back, but we're interested in sort of breaking through to the other side of issues of the energy costs associated with imported grain, for instance. Like, there is no way that we can tackle issues of global warming in this state house without addressing the energy consumption that goes into food production. It's the door that brought us in, it's the door that's gonna take us back out. Fundamentally, the challenge that we're, we're facing right now is that what we're doing is ultimately a disruptive behavior. It's, it's disrupting sort of the way we typically think of farms operating. And what you're seeing is a regulatory um, reaction to that that um, isn't actually based in a legal or legislative framework. It's based on sort of reaction, personal opinion. Um, <laughs> You're feeling tight on time, so I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna keep moving here. Yeah, yeah. One or two minutes. Okay, so um, the Anthony's bill specifically in, um, endorses this activity as something that is considered farming because that right now our status as a farm yeah. is um, not only at risk. We've been told we are not a farm. Um, there are many many implications yeah. to that. Which, Why do they call you short? <laughs> yeah, all sorts of things, farm. but most of them aren't appropriate in here. But uh, <laughs> they would be surprised. The, yeah, <laughs> I would be. Yeah. But the, you know, for us, the implications of not being a farm are much greater than having to obtain this A and R solid waste permit. That is sort of the, um, the story that I find very insulting because we all understand in this room how important your farm status is to a farmer, and we would be out of business if we. How many yards a year do you? I had this conversation. How many yards a year do you do you process through? Uh, total material, I mean, the, the, we sell about a thousand yards of finished compost, but uh, the hens eat it. I mean, we're probably handled, they're probably consuming 50% of what we initially handle, so we handle a lot more than what we end up selling. So 2,000, 2,500 yards? Maybe. Something like that, yep. And we ship eggs all throughout uh, Vermont into the Boston area. And, uh, the other two things, just because this is not exclusively about this bill, but I can answer those questions, is um, in the last year, um, there, there are two issues within the URL, the Universal Recycling Law, that ANR has reinterpreted. And they have reinterpreted it in favor of industrialization of the food system. And so um, we are no longer source separate. They're no longer requiring people to source separate organic materials from trash. Uh, this, is, this is initiating the race to the bottom that we all feared when we initially worked on the universal recycling law seven years ago. Um, and so we are now knowingly sending microplastics into food producing soils. Um, and we are knowingly taking high quality HTP plastic, recyclable plastic that was previously getting recycled, covering it in food scraps, rendering it unrecyclable, and now sending it to incinerators that wouldn't be legal in the state. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, we're really going wild. Well. So, there are a variety of these things. I won't belabor them. There are more, but I, I, I guess at the end of the day, the singular message that I would provide is that one of the greatest problems that I see as somebody trying to affect change in this community is that as bills leave here, they basically get relegated to one agency. 
The other agencies do not consider them to be the laws of the land. They consider them to be, if it's a soft waste bill, it goes to ANR. If it's a food system bill, like carbon plate, it goes to ag. They don't each uh, um, maintain a degree of accountability to those. And I think there's a feedback loop that's lacking that's putting us in a position where we're actually really undermining the capacity of the state to do the work that we need to do right now. Uh, yeah. We need to move along, I suspect, but I hope we'll invite Tom back. Wow. Well, yeah, Tom and Tom. Because he's getting a lot of the notes that a lot of us are trying to How did the conversation go upstairs? Um, well, it looks like, I'll tell you the secret. It looks like the House Ag Committee might be spiking uh, their uh, their meal at the farm show with marijuana. <laughs> <laughs> wow. They're, they're really out to beat you guys this year. Yeah, they're they, always they, they beat us yeah. last year. They um, <laughs> we were just glad not to be last. Uh, yeah, I think these guys are going to watch their screen for the press conference. Yeah. With, yeah. And Catherine and, uh, yeah. Well, thank you very much for your well, time this morning. Sorry you know, thank you so much. Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you all as well. And just, yeah, thank you for all your support. And feel free to visit or connect with us anytime. So. Good, how are you doing? This is, you guys are all part of the Housing and Conservation Coalition Day, right? We are. Um, oh, there are two days on the same day. I, it's exciting. Yeah, there are. So much vibrancy in our state. So, um, why don't you guys just introduce yourselves? We'll introduce ourselves, and then Nick, are you going first? Yeah, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go first. Do a quick intro for folks, and then yeah. let's do that. Let's do a quick round of interest from us. So, Richard, you want to start us off? Yeah, Richard Hall from East Montpelier. Uh, Justin Rich from Huntington. Shannon Barley from Stratford. Jen Lambert from Washington. And Miles Hooper from Randolph. And I'm Nick Richardson. I live in Jericho, and I work here in Montpelier. Uh, Brian Collimore, representing the Rutland District. Ruth Hardy, representing the Addison District. Chris Pearson from Chittenden. Anthony Colina, Washington County. Great, great. Well, thank you for coming. And yeah. uh, I'm the vice chair. I don't. Bobby is almost always here, so yeah. I'll follow <laughs> through. But Nick, why don't you take it away? Great. Uh, We've thanks. Got about an hour. Yeah. Th oh. Thanks, Senator Pearson. I'm just going to take a few minutes up at the top here, and then. I'm really excited to turn it over to uh, the group of farmers that we have here with us today um, to really give you the sense of on the ground across the state. We have a great cross-section here of folks who are in engaged in farming day in, day out on behalf of all of us here in Vermont to make sure that we have a vibrant, viable ag economy and community here going forward. We talked a lot about this last week when I was there at the presentation of the um, the Vermont Agency of Agriculture, Farms, and Markets, their, their new strategic plan. Um, and got to hear about all the different areas where they're thinking about trying to grow our ag economy and the investments that are going to be needed in order to make that happen. Um, we're here today to just reinforce and remind and I think you know, have our best advocates here to really do the talking on behalf of their experience about how important full, fund, full <coughs> statutory funding for, for the Vermont Housing Conservation Board is to ensuring that those investments will take hold and be successful for the future of Vermont going forward. Each of these farmers has benefited in a way that they'll describe um, from their participation with us and with VHCB in housing and conservation work. Um, it's been an extraordinary partnership that's lasted for you know, decades, and I think it had a really significant impact on the state of Vermont. So we're going to spend some time talking about that today um, with you, and we really appreciate the time and the chance to be able to come in and discuss it. Again, for the record, my name is Nick Richardson. I'm the president and CEO of the Vermont Land Trust. I've been in that position for two years now. Um, the Vermont Land Trust is a 42-year-old organization, which makes it just a few months older than I am, um, dedicated to conservation of the state's natural resource, and in particular, its working landscape. Um, that's been such a focus of ours, uh, working with rural communities, farmers, producers, forest land, foresters, um, to make sure that we continue to use those assets in a way that really benefits all of Vermont, and that we all stay connected to the working landscape that we, we love and we cherish so much. Um, that's requiring more from us today than it ever has. Um, and we know that it's not enough just to conserve land, to just put conservation easements in place, pop some champagne, and then say we're done, right? That's, it's really just the beginning, and we're um, addressing that uh, through a, a really a sort of broad set of work that is uh, coming out for the Vermont Land Trust these days. It's around farmland access. So you'll hear folks talking about working with us to get access to land, get onto land, make sure that it's permanently affordable. 
Um, we're working on payments for ecosystem services. I'm sure there's a lot of discussion that's happening around that. We're actually doing the first aggregated forest carbon project in the country. is happening here in Vermont, bringing private landowners together, a dozen landowners in the northern Green Mountains, um, to get those landowners <coughs> access to forest carbon revenue. And we hope to be working with the Nature Conservancy and other folks to do more of that going forward. I'd also love to see us you know, working with partners to develop soil health, soil carbon uh, credits, a similar kind of approach, taking what we're learning on forest land and doing that similar work on farmland. So, so it, conservation easements are a starting place, but they're really not the end. Um, and if we're going to maintain a vibrant and viable future for our rural communities in Vermont, it really needs to be all hands on deck. We are addressing that by asking the question, what does Vermont need from us today? And we're answering it in ways that are very different from the ways that we've uh, answered it in the past continuing to do a lot of great conservation work across the state. Uh, we're very active in that space. We're one of the most active land trusts in the country uh, in terms of the number of easements that we've done and the number of easements that we've done on an annual basis. But for us, it's really just a starting place and thinking about what is the impact that needs to be had on this landscape and for, in order for all of us to be successful. So we're really glad to have the chance to come in um, and present that to you today. The full statutory funding for VHCB on this year would be about $22.3 million is essential to that. Uh, we've been in a process, in a sort of situation where what started as a great idea and investment in low income housing and affordable housing in this state and conservation at this full value has been kind of eroded over time, put into strange different pieces in the capital budget. Um, it's, you know, there's an opportunity, I think, to return that to the original vision and the intent of that legislation, which was to have a robust ongoing investment in these really important resources. And the treasurer Pierce, I think, was very eloquent in describing the need and the value of that investment in the resource report that she gave. So um, you know, with that said, I just want to uh, open in that way and give that framing to the discussion, and then really just turn it over to the farmers that are here with us today. It's snowing outside. They all have farm operations that are going right now. Farming doesn't stop. And they've taken time out of their days uh, to come and spend it here uh, uh, it, talking to you, sharing their stories, and helping all of us understand the importance of this on the ground. So I really honor you all for taking the time to come in and, and, um, and present here uh, in the State House with us today. And I really appreciate you doing that. I think we'll start off um, today with Shannon Barley from the Stratford Village Park. <laughs> Stratford. <laughs> um, I'm My name is Shannon. I'm Orange County um, down in Stratford, and I run a diversified farm that was a, uh, an old dairy farm in the town of Stratford, 178 acres, and I run it with my husband, who's a former U.S. Marine, and my two children. We raise lamb, uh, beef, and pork, and we also do a big vegetable CSA, and we have an on-farm farm market that we've converted the, um, the, the milk house of our old barn into a, a farm stand that's open um, every week. And so we serve mostly Stratford and a few surrounding towns. Um, but we landed on this particular farm in November of 2016 after 15 years of flipping and turning um, smaller houses and pieces of real estate so that we could have finally afford land, which is a big barrier for people <coughs> my age who either aren't um, are in line to inherit farmland or you know aren't coming from a lot of money or financial backup. So uh, the financial access and the land access was a real barrier for us. So we worked really, really hard for a very long time to get to the point where we could afford um, you know, kind of like the big kahuna uh, for us, uh, the land and the infrastructure and the buildings that we needed to be able to run the operation that we envisioned. Um, and so the only way that we were able to do that and leverage that was because we, we were really hoping that through the land trust in VHCB that we would be able to secure a conservation easement that would then make it affordable and let us focus an already tricky economic uh, lifestyle with, um, with uh, being able to, to get this off the ground. So anyhow, we um, purchased that in 2016 with some creative financing. And in June of 2019, we settled on our conservation easement. So we um, conserved 100 acres of the 178 acres. And that allowed us to have some breathing room around our mortgage payments and also 
uh, opened up some room to be able to put money into infrastructure, which is a huge cost uh, for <coughs> trying to do this. So at any rate, um, we ha were really well received in the community. We have really wide community support. We host several fundraising events on the farm. Uh, we're really angled towards more of a community farm um, structure than, um, than anything else. And what an unintended consequence of this farm has been actually has been the, the number of people that have stopped us. Before we purchased the farm in 2016, the, the, this farm sat vacant for years and years. Um, and it had had this very established presence in town as the Lewis Dairy Farm. And so when that dairy farm went kaput in the 80s, um, I, it went through a few owners, but for the most part, it wasn't being used. The land wasn't being used. And so one of the un, unintended consequences of this purchase is how hugely enthusiastic the community is to see the farm actually being used as a farm um, and to see things being grown on it and to see animals back in the pasture. And I really can't tell you the number of people that have stopped us everywhere to tell us how important it is to see that part of the valley being used as a farm again. Um, and so what's really struck me is that is how important farms are to kind of our rural legacies in terms of um, the cultural significance of farms. Um, but also, and this is a less tangible thing, but especially right now, I think in rural America, it's easy to lose hope that we're not disintegrating. And I think what, uh, what this has really brought home for me is that this has given our town a lot of hope. And I'm not saying that as shameless self-promotion. It really, like, if it were me or anyone else sitting here, um, it's become so clear what an important, what an, an important role working farms have in our rural communities. So um, the other important piece to our farm is that the west branch of the Ampapanusik River uh, runs through, it starts in Berkshire and it comes down through our <coughs> valley and feeds into the Connecticut River. And so as part of the deal when, when we uh, worked out the conservation easement is we agreed to a 50 foot riparian buffer on both sides of the river. Um, and that is being planted with some deep-rooted tree plantings. I think there's seven acres in total of buffer that will be planted this spring, and that's in partnership with the Connecticut River Conservancy, NRCS, and hopefully VHCB. I'm applying for a water quality grant um, through them to help offset the cost of that. Um, and again, this isn't shameless self-promotion, but I think just talking about the role that farms play as a community service. So there's the, the kind of the cultural broader piece of providing um, providing what, what townspeople really see as a legacy. But then there's this other piece that is the conservation practices. And I think there's a broader um, benefit to farms who are conscientious of these things, pollinator crops, the riparian buffer, um, carbon sequestration, any, any number of things that we're doing day to day, um, you know, either passively or intentionally are happening and um, all with an eye to making sure that we're doing things responsibly in the right way and growing food for our community. So. Um, all of that to say, I was really impressed when I realized that transfer tax money, which I've cursed over and over again every real estate <laughs> transaction yeah, that we've right. had, I hate paying that transfer tax, but what made it so wonderful to me was to know that <clears throat> that's where this funding comes from, and I think that's really brilliant, and um, <laughs> I've even told friends who I've been really active with in other states, um, I've said, you've got to, you know, this is such a model for other states, I feel, and um, I'm so appreciative of that. And, I, and I'm appreciative of the easement and the collaboration with VHCP and VHCB and the land trust, because without that, um, we, would, we would really be trying to keep our heads above water right now. It's just e eased it so that we can focus on what we're, what we're here to do, which is grow food. So um, I just want to thank you. We, we had testimony from uh, folks at UVM Extension, as I guess it was last week, who have worked on the pasteurization, or excuse me, the um, grazing. grazing folks, and they were reporting that farmers who have made that transition 
uh, report a higher quality of life, uh -huh. higher satisfaction. Yeah. You're suggesting that it extends outside of the boundaries of the farm Absolutely. into the community. I think that's yeah. it's not surprising, but it's it's uh, an unintended consequence in, yeah. in the really best is. of sense. That's yeah. really cool. Maybe I'd appreciate it more as well. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Richard, would you mind? Speaking next, sure. sure. Yeah, thanks. Give it a whirl. Um, so, uh, I'd like to thank everybody for the opportunity to talk about what the land trust has done for us and our family um, at Fairmont Farm and um, and the funding from the HCB. So, uh, so I'm Richard Hall, and I'm one of five owners uh, at Fairmont Farm. Um, and my wife Bonnie and my nephew Tucker Purchase and then my oldest daughter Claire Ayer and uh, my son uh, Ricky Hall are all part of the farm now and uh, we recently uh, formed a new entity to bring the, the two, my two kids in and that's been a big part of our, our farm something that I'm probably the most proud of is um, we uh, worked pretty hard with my folks and Austin Cleves uh, back uh, 20 years ago to, to do a buyout with them and um, and now recently we've we've done this with bring my kids in and uh, and in between we my, my brother left the farm and we were able to bring Tucker in um, and so that's that's been a big part of our operation through those years um, I think uh, Fairmont Farm we incorporated in 92 um, and we uh, at that point we milked about 300 cows and currently we're up to 1600 cows and we um, we milk in a, two locations <coughs> one in East Montpelier one in East Grassburg um, we grow about 1,600 acres of corn, and we cover about uh, 2,200 acres of hay ground uh, from Barry, Vermont to Glover. So we, we, uh, we cover, cover some area. Um, we uh, primarily grow our own forage, but we also, uh, on a good corn year, which wasn't this last year, but uh, we, will, we will grow quite a bit of high moisture corn too. So, uh, what else? We uh, we've cons I was uh, just thinking about our connection with conservation, and um, my father, John Hall, and Austin were big proponents of conservation uh, 30 years ago, and um, they our first property was conserved at that point, and. Um, both farms were separate at that point and we have both conserved land and then we came together and currently we own about uh, 1,650 acres of conserved property um, that is both tillable and woodland. Um, our town in East Montpelier has done a lot of work with conservation. There was a fund developed um, in the town by my father and Austin were big parts of that. And that's been used quite a bit. So we also farm about um, 550 acres of conserved property that we don't own. Um, uh, let's see, what else am I thinking of covering? Um, we, uh, uh, through the years, the uh, bringing in the new kids, we have some different stuff going on. My daughter's doing a a community kind of day camp at the farm. That's something that's uh, recently been happening. Um, and she's been a big part of sort of getting the message out about dairy. And, and, and as we are now one of two farms in East Montpelier, <coughs> there's more and more need to kind of get the word out. Um, uh, let's see, I think, um, I think the, what we have found over the years um, that happens to us is we rent a fair amount of property um, during the time that there might be a generational transfer of property that we rent is typically when um, decisions are made 
as to selling that, that land or to doing something else with that land. And so if you're dependent on that acreage to, uh, as part of your operation, you tend to come up against um, a request to buy that property at that time when a, when a generational transfer occurs. And that typically has been when we have um, bought property. And in our area, I think that property is priced generally two to three times more than ag value. Um, and um, it, because we feel like we have a farm that's um, got younger generation coming in, we feel really comfortable uh, with conservation. It's been, it's been really good for us. And so we, typically that's when we look um, to conserve property is when we're, we're gonna purchase land. Um, we have purchased a little bit of property um, without conserving, but I would say the majority um, we've tried to use conservation. Um, uh, Where do you ship your milk? <coughs> it you goes to our, or no, Cabot? it's Agrimark, Ag and, and our milk goes into the Cabot plant. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. Can I ask another question? Just this is a very specific question, but you mentioned the the camp, the summer yeah. camp. Yeah. Have you? Uh, had any issues with um, insurance for that camp, or is your uh, uh, liability insurance just including it in your regular um, farm insurance? That's a good question. It's a real good question. <laughs> it's something I was looking into in the yeah. off session, so I just thought I'd ask you. Yeah. Well, you got the wrong person. Because okay. <laughs> Clara would be able to answer that, but yes, we have had some issues with insurance, okay. and Clara has worked pretty hard to make sure we feel comfortable doing it and I and but I can't tell you exactly what she is okay. but I know there's been some special well, five further insurance. questions maybe I'll, this is is her name Clara or Claire Clara Clara Air. okay yeah because yeah. my predecessor was Senator Claire Air. oh yeah oh, wow. <laughs> yeah and my sister's name is Clara okay so oh, yeah. I need to meet Claire yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um thank you yeah, yeah. Um, thank you Great. I think um, we're gonna, and I think if we move through, we'll have time for questions at the end. Uh, Miles, would you please sure. next? Great. Yeah. So, um, Miles Hooper. Uh, I am now the. Did you just hear a resemblance to somebody yeah. you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, um, our our first interaction with the land trust was in 2012 when our family business, Vermont Creamery which both my brothers and I grew up putting cheese in boxes all summer long, um, uh, decided that in order to leverage a, milk, a goat's milk supply in Vermont, we had to go out and start a farm. We couldn't just go out and say, hey, you guys got to ship more milk. You know, we had to commiserate with them and, and be in it. And so we started Ayersbrook Goat Dairy um, in 2012. Um, you know, there, was, there wasn't a bank under the sun that was going to lend money to a startup goat dairy. So we, we coalesced a bunch of, uh, you know, um, it, we did some creative financing. And um, of course, Land Trust was the biggest player um, in that whole acquisition. That was an extremely important farm. 116 acres still is an extremely important farm. Uh, 116 acres right outside the village of Randolph. And it was, you know, this, the developers were just like, ooh, gosh, that's gonna be easy site work down there with all that sand and nice bottom land. And um, the town was really concerned about what the future of it was because the Hodgtons, um, Perry and Carol Hodgton, who are well known in, um, in the Jersey Association, but Perry was a milk tester, so he was known statewide. Um, the, the town was concerned about what the future of this farm was, and it actually wasn't for sale at the time that we bought it. We just went and knocked on the door and asked the question, and um, Land Trust stepped in and provided about $450,000 for the um, sale of that easement. They purchased that easement for about $450,000. And without that cash in hand, um, we could have never 
made built out the operation and 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 made that that big investment in um, in the goat sector. Um, so that was huge. Uh, fast. So just warning about goats, making a million mistakes, figuring it out, moving forward. Um, 2017, was it? Roughly. Yeah. Jeez. Uh, yeah. Um, we made a play for the, um, for 150 acres right off exit four, which was slated <laughs> for the largest development in Vermont history. So the, so the square footage of, of the master plan that the developer had put forward was totaled more than like Taft's Corners. So you want to talk about like m major character change of an important, you know, central Vermont town. There it was. Um, you know, and we also took the position that uh, interstate development would um, interfere with the with the the downtown's viability, that can be debated both ways a little bit, but um, we wanted people to shop in the downtown. And so it was more than just, just, just seizing the opportunity to own another piece of farmland. It was like, how do we kind of protect our rural economy and not let it, not let the multinationals just set up along the interstate corridor. Um, <clears throat> so um, that, that was a big lift. Um, that was an extremely important easement, and ultimately, the town was eternally grateful that that 150 um, acres had been conserved. And um, in conjunction with a with another project just nearby to conserve the remaining 22 acres, now the whole 172 is conserved. The magnificent whale tails are, are sitting right there, walking across to the Green, uh, green Mountains. Um, and it's really an absolute, um, it, it's just that we will be so grateful in 50 years that we did that. Um, I remember distinctly uh, that, um, I think it was the, the Missoula Observer, or some, some newspaper from <coughs> Missoula, Montana, came out, they, they sent somebody out to cover this story. Um, Montana's a long way away from here. Um, because and, of the interstate exchange? Well, what, what's going on in uh, Montana is you've got some, some cities that are starting to push out. And the farmers are faced with, okay, do I try to generationally transition this land? Is this our chance to finally capitalize? Like, you know, how do we, how do we hang on to it when valuations are rising all the time? So what they did was they came out and they interviewed, I don't know, a, a dozen people or that were involved in the project. And they really wrote that as a model for, designing a land trust that would continue to preserve, conserve land right outside the city limits um, because they were concerned about the, the city sprawl. Um, so I was like, wow, you know, not only they, not only they hear about it, like that, that's remarkable in itself, but also had the ambition to come out, study it, and report back to try and create a model in their own state. And I thought that that was quite significant. Um, I'm very fortunate um, myself to have been in a position where um, the Creamery, Vermont Creamery, was able to basically guarantee to our financial partners, our, our lenders, that you know, we're gonna go start a goat dairy. We know that no, you know, there isn't a lot of track a lot of a high uh, success rate for these types of operations, um, but we're going we're gonna to do this. And of course, the land was not owned by a family member, or there was no generational transition there. It was, the land was having to be purchased from the Hodgsons. Um, so I, I'm very fortunate to have be, be able to be the steward of all that now. And... Um, <clears throat> 
I really, I don't understand how somebody coming out of VTC or UVM with a degree in animal science and they want it, or, 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 or diversified agriculture or whatever, can get onto a piece of property without the land trust. I just, I don't see how it's mathematically possible. The, um, the margin on a goat dairy, cow dairy, vegetable farm, organic dairy, um, you know, there, it's minute. A lot of cash coming and going, but the amount you hold on to, you know, is is small. And so lenders are not are not behind these kind of projects in 2020. Um, and I, I see Vermont Land Trust and BHCB as being absolutely an absolutely essential mechanism to making sure that there is a younger generation coming on to these um, these 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 parcels, these farms, um, because most farmers in Vermont, I think, view their unconserved land as their 401k. And so when they, so without somebody like Land Trust to make up that delta between the young, ambitious, ambitious the young, ambitious, knowledgeable person that, that is hell-bent on being a farmer, um, then I, I don't, I, if the land trust's not there, I don't see how it's possible, honestly. Um, so I think that with everything, the, the way that, the rate at which our world is changing, we are going to be so grateful that we held on to farmland in, in subsequent generations. Miles, that's, that's great. I think just to, to build out a little bit on, on what you're talking about, um, provide some context, there's so goat dairy didn't really exist as a business in Vermont in a, in a large scale way before your farm operation got started and there are whole pockets of it around. Um, there are now how many goats in Vermont that are part of goat dairies? It's there's been significant growth it's, since your farm operation the, began. The growth is, is considerable. Um, there is a there is a quite a significant project on the horizon right now um, where we're, we're transitioning a large dairy, cow dairy to goats. Um, and I think, but also <clears throat> just beyond, you know, <clears throat> Vermont, um, Vermont is one microcosm, but we are seeing goat dairy as kind of a, you know, the goat's milk category and all things goat continuing to grow. I love this photo, by the way. <laughs> yeah. We all got it. <laughs> Where are those from? Uh, they're from our raw oh. goat friend. Uh, Frank. Frank. Yeah. Frank. Yeah. 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 You can personalize them. They're all different to reflect the person. So, so, um, goats, so goats are becoming yeah. a really important part of Vermont's agricultural industry yeah. across the you know across the region. That's becoming true. That wasn't true 10 years ago. It's true now. So it's a really exciting thing. And just to the point of like bringing other resources in, um, how conservation works. You know, there's literally hundreds of millions of dollars of federal money that's come into Vermont as a result of the Vermont Housing Conservation Board and our continued investment and uh, in funding conservation through VHCB. So when you think about the full statutory funding for VHCB, consider also the incredible leverage that comes in behind that. And what we don't spend enough time talking about here is the leverage of private investment. Over $100 million of private investment has gone into conservation over the last 30 years. Um, so you got, you've got to think about that as a big chunk that we don't spend enough time thinking about. Private capital that comes in to support this because people care so much about the stories that you're hearing today. So I um, just wanted to give that additional context. Jen, can I ask you to speak Yeah, sure. Great. Actually, Thanks. you set me right up. Perfect. <laughs> you set me up for my story. So uh, I was raised in Waitsfield, Vermont. Um, and then in high school, started milking cows and feeding calves after school and decided, well, I might as well go to VTC for their ag program. Uh, while I was there, I was lucky enough to get a two plus two scholarship to go to UVM and minor institute. And while I was in school and afterwards, I was able to get a job at a big 600 cow dairy in Brookfield, uh, Sprig Ranch and um, met my husband while I was working there and after being herdsman for a 
couple years, it became obvious to me that I'd rather, I really wanted to own my own place, I wanted to own my own cows. And came upon my husband's great uncle uh, was looking to retire. So, which is a short distance of where we were living, so I thought, man, this is great. So uh, one night I showed up at his farm and asked him if he wanted to sell me his cows. <laughs> and he looked at me like I was insane. <laughs> and uh, after a while he said, okay, yeah, maybe we can, maybe we'll, we'll think about doing this. So I approached multiple bankers and they all kind of <laughs> gave Why me, would you want to milk him? kind of gave me this weird look and asked me how much money I had in the bank. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, uh, none. <laughs> but I went to two plus two. I managed this big dairy. I, <laughs> look how educated I am. I know what I'm doing. So they kind of sent me on my way. Okay, kid, see you later. Um, so what ended up happening is we did some fancy financing with uh, the current owner, Richard Lambert, and a family friend stepped up and decided that Together, they would finance the cows for us. So we bought the cows and rented the farm. And so that went along pretty well for a little while. And after a couple years, we were able to be able to prove. Like, okay, so we're cash flowing, you know, paying the grain bill, making payments. But the problem was is what we were paying for rent, the mortgage was going to be two to three times as much. And so <laughs> there was no way we were going to be able to afford this mortgage, which is when Vermont Land Trust stepped in, uh, started working with them, and they were able to buy the conservation easement on the farm, making the mortgage much more affordable. The mortgage was ended up being about what we were paying for rent. So it made it much easier for us to cash flow. And uh, made it well enough to cash flow that we were able to afford to put in two milking robots. Um, I think Vermont Land Trust coming in and helping us buy our farm is what really greenlighted so much of the innovation on our farms. Uh, people come to see our farms to talk to us. We're very positive innovative place. I have enough time that I'm able to come for Farm Bureau, come to events like this. Um, I don't remember having that much time when I was in the parlor constantly. Couldn't ever seem to get help. Um, milking cows is really hard and stressful and at very odd times of the day. Now with the robots we're able to hire just a completely higher higher level of person, the, the hours that they're, that they're there to work are much more manageable, more like a normal job. But I associate all of these positive changes with Vermont Land Trust coming in and making life just easier. And I, I think about what everyone's been saying about uh, Vermont Land Trust farmers having a better quality of life, and absolutely, we have a better quality of life. That, take some of the stress off so that we were able to think more clearly and make more investments to our farm. And I'm not sure what would have happened if Vermont Land Trust hadn't been there. Would we have been able to afford our farm? I'm not sure. It might have happened, but it might have happened years later. I don't know if the, the pressure of having to make those payments would have made us eventually exit the dairy? I'm not sure. It's, uh, but I'm very grateful that they were there to help us buy our farm and we're actually working on another project right now um, so that we can grow our farm even more. Uh, there's another big chunk of land that's contiguous to our farm so we're really excited about grabbing more land. Um, thinking about what Richard was saying, <laughs> when far, when land comes up for sale, it's not when your checkbook is ready. It's when people are retiring or a health issue. 
Um, so we've actually got multiple neighbors that are kind of like knocking on our door, like, oh, hey, we're, we're ready. <laughs> it's like, oh, wonderful. <laughs> we're not, but, you know, and it's just, it's great to have Vermont Line Trust there to support you and <laughs> help you make some of those decisions uh, to figure out what's possible. Uh, I know the future of our farm is going to depend on us owning land. We rent a tremendous amount of acreage right now. And uh, our long-term goal is to own as much acreage as possible so that our business doesn't depend on, you know, someone else letting you rent acreage for 50 bucks an acre or whatever. Um, so, yeah, very grateful for Vermont Land Trust. Nick, is, is there a rule of thumb on, on what the conservation, is it a third of the value often or half or? It, it can vary widely depending on what region of the state we're talking about, what the development value is. Brent, I'm not sure if you have that. Yeah, I kind of thumb. typically describe it, so for Hazelton Farm Project Director, it's a bell curve, maybe around 50%, anywhere from maybe 30 to 70 is the typical range yeah. of an overall you know, value of the property. Yeah. We have a lot of road frontage. So it was so about not, half. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so it's, it's significant, right? Either way, right? 30, 50, 70 percent, we're talking about a significant part of the value. So when that comes out, it makes the capital basis for farming, you know, a lot, a lot easier for folks to bear. So what happens when <clears throat> years from now you're ready to retire and maybe you don't have somebody in your family wants to take over your farm and you want to sell it? The easement goes with it, but what about the financing? then for the new owner of anybody's farm, not specifically yours, but you know, how does it work in another 50 years when there might need to be another transfer? Would you be able to then help with financing again, or is it just a one-time deal? Do you know what I mean? Well, that, that, that reduction in the capital base should stay. So once we do it, you're talking about that land being at agricultural value. So when these folks sell it, they're also going to be selling it on at, at, lower, at value. lower value but they will have been able to realize a higher economic return yeah. off of it. And yes, the land trust will still be there, and I, you know, I won't be there 50 years from now, but if I have anything to say about it, we'll still be doing very active work around pairing the next generation of farmers to land, just like we're doing today. Um, I think it's so important because we're going to really need a lot of first-generation farmers to keep ag alive and well in Vermont. A lot of young people have been turned off by their families dairy in one way or another or the transition just hasn't happened and I think it's gonna take a lot of yeah a lot of people coming out of ag school to fill these roles. So folks we have we have one more um, one more farmer who's with us today to give a testimony. Senator Starr I just wanted to say hello. Thank you for having yeah. us in. We've heard today so far from Shannon Barley in Stratford. Um, Richard yeah. Hall, who you probably know from East Lump County or Craftsbury, yeah. Matt, yeah, a couple, a couple of times. <laughs> Miles Hooper here, it may look familiar to you. Yeah. Uh, and Jen Lambert was just giving a presentation as well. Yeah, I know. <laughs> you're on the right side to help. <laughs> I forgot what you yes, told me. I am. <laughs> She's on the right side to help, so she got in the north. Yeah. She's on my Great. Yeah, that's a just a great, great conversation about <laughs> all things, uh, all things <laughs> conservation and the importance of continued funding for the So, yeah. thank you. Um, and Justin Rich is going to close us out with testimony. So Justin, uh, Justin Rich from Burnt Rock Farm in Huntington. And just to follow up on Senator Harvey's question, it's a nice question to be able to say, like, well, what's the exit strategy in 40 years for these farms are being conserved? Because that presupposes that there's been an entry strategy. <laughs> and without <laughs> conserved land in a state like ours, there'd be a hell of a lot fewer entry strategies mm -hmm. into our business. Mm -hmm. um, we've been at our farm since 2008. We bought our original farm, which is 17 acres mm -hmm. in 2008. Not conserved, but it was during a recession right after the stock market collapsed and nobody was buying houses. So we got a foreclosure. Um, so our own trade of farming was that. And the fact that my wife works full-time off farm and always has, so our cash flow position can be better than a lot of folks who are trying to derive an entire family's income from farming. We grow organic vegetables. We're doing almost 90, 95% wholesale at this point. So a lot of our product leaves the state, goes down to Boston. I actually don't know where a lot of it ends up. It goes south. 
how do you get them down there? So we're members of Deep Root uh, Organic Farmers Cooperative. We ship through two different companies that go down to the Boston area too. Our local truck doesn't really leave Chittenden and Madison counties. So we run deliveries to Burlington twice a week, this time near Middlebury once a week. Um, but we're, we're kind of in a medium scale for farming, mm -hmm. vegetable farming. Um, so we're growing 20 acres of vegetables, and doesn't sound like that much, but 20 acres of organic vegetables has the economic impact of a 100 cow dairy at this point. So, so a lot it's, of it's something there, yeah. So we're in a valley with one 250 cow dairy, teeny bit of beef, and then mostly houses. So our valley is a 10 mile long strip of land along the river, mostly a mile wide or less. So our whole valley is probably 400 tillable acres. Um, and it's all amazing soil. So an interesting thing was, so we bought our original farm in 2008. We've leased a couple different parcels ranging from one acre to 10 acres along a six mile strip of the valley. So I'm driving my tractors on the road all the time which I think some people probably find annoying, but I think is a good public service. <laughs> because it's, yeah. first of all, I'm going the speed limit for about two miles out of it because they're teeny little villages with 25 mile an hour limits. But I just think it's good for people to see tractors on the road. Yeah. yeah. I think it's good for people to slow down every now and then. It's funny when the cyclists try to draft behind me because it makes me a lot uncomfortable, but what's the deal? But, Conservation didn't come into our farm until about year nine. So we bought our original farm, we rented from a couple of really great neighbors. We bought a landlocked river bottom parcel for relatively cheap, non-conserved, because it didn't have any development ability because there was no access. So the town granted us access to the town garage, agricultural access only, so that field is de facto conserved, even though not legally. But then two and a half years ago, an elderly neighbor passed away and his 76 acre farm came up. Well, it wasn't even up for sale yet, and I do that thing where you say, can I call the lawyer yet? <laughs> you know, a couple months after he passed away, he didn't have any farming heirs, and I said, are you interested in selling the parsley? And he says, yeah. <laughs> we worked up a price based on the appraisal, and during that appraisal process, I went and met with Al Karnas at the Land Trust, and I said, okay, so here's how much it's gonna cost. We can cash flow this for a couple of years. Well, not cash flow, we can pay for it for a few years. But an important part of being able to buy the 76 acre parcel will be getting the value down a bit. And so all along the way of the land trust, I actually couldn't believe how they were able to predict things like, yeah, that'll probably be 18, maybe 19 months from now that this hurdle will be crossed. And they were pretty much right. Within like two weeks the whole time. I guess they're professionals. <laughs> but so that was summer of 2017. We didn't close until fall 2017. And the whole time we had this big mortgage payment and we weren't in current use by the way yet either. So it was a very expensive two years before the land trust money finally came through. But um, we finally got the conservation easement on 18 of those 76 acres this fall. So my wife and I always were like, you know, we, why do we feel like we have no money? But there's enough coming in. I said, well, it's the amount going out at the moment. So between conserving that field, renting, I fix up the house two hundred ago, rented that out. So now we can actually cash flow farmland purchase, which is a pretty nice feeling and pretty rare in the world of production ag to cash flow land. Is that right tied to your land? It's a mile and a half up the road, which is really good for me. So we do organic vegetables, which means we don't have very good fungicides or insecticides. So it's nice to be able to take our potatoes one year, five acres in this field, move them six miles up the road next year. The bugs are really lazy. They don't fly that far. You can really grow a much better crop that way with specialty crops. Other things are less sensitive. Um, I, so that the land trust, it didn't get us into farming. It's allowing us to expand our business in a way that allows us to meet our local and regional um, demand. And like I said, I think it's a good, it's helping us keep a town, which is really on the rural suburban fringe at the moment, from going fully into more of the suburban. And not that there's anything really wrong with suburban living, but you know, a lot of people in our town, I think, would really be sad to see that nice 18-acre field surrounded by houses, by the way. It's in a fishbowl. Mm -hmm. But those people all love it now. We had sheep grazing there until a week ago. It's really nice. Um, and also, it's helping keep a little bit of a rural economic engine going in our town. I mean, the dairy in town is obviously significantly larger than we are, so they're the real example of rural economic activity. But 
Yeah, you know, I'm in town all day. There's not a lot of people who work in town. I mean, they work in town. Right. They come here, they go to Middlebury, they go to Burlington. There's a small group of us who work in Huntington during the day. And it's, you know, I'd like to see a little bit more of that. Are you on the fire? No, I'm not on the fire. I have two How little... have they not gotten you? <laughs> <laughs> I have two little children. Okay. So they're they're always too. looking for people who are working in Huntington because everybody yeah. leaves. And then what if there's fire? The fire department doing pretty good. Yeah. And I, I have one buddy who says, like, so, uh, <laughs> Monday? Yeah. Don't got you. Okay. I have a three year old. <laughs> You're going to have another kid just to keep it. <laughs> I don't know about that. No. Um, but that's just a pitch for saying it's It's not just about, it is about keeping farmland open as farmland. But yeah. having open farmland is nice. It's nice for the views. It's nice for I can make my living. But it also sets the tone for rural towns mm -hmm. to actually have functional rural economies. Okay. I just, I, I just reflect that, you know, of the five folks that we brought in to testify today, four of them are per, were participants in our farmland access program. We did 100 farmland transitions over the last 10 years. So we're seeing an example of four. There are 100 across the state. We have this headline view of agriculture that has a lot of challenge in it and a lot of or gloom and doom. What we're showing you today is a lot of really excited, enthusiastic, savvy entrepreneurs who are coming into this landscape and doing something. And those aren't our ideas. We are creating the conditions, the possibility for people to be successful in this land. Both established existing dairy farms are such a crucial part of our farm economy and will be for many years to come, and a diversified set of, of younger farm businesses that are coming in as well. So I know we're short on time and you guys have a thing, but. Um, uh, they're coming in. We got people coming in a few months. I don't know if there are other questions that you have. Well, did you talk about some of the other activities that? You folks do for rural communities like up at the, like the Scott Farm. And I gave the briefest of preamble spot. One thing that wasn't mentioned is, and we've got a lot of it on our conserved property, is the trail system. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we have, and it's really heavily used, and um, I think really appreciated. I do have a I do have a slide presentation that I can send to the committee that talks about that gives more of a detail on us. I'd be happy to come in and do a more overview of the Vermont Land Trust if that'd be interesting, including the work that we're doing with rural economic development, like what we're doing at Scott Farm. Uh, how's the um, how's it looking in the budget this year? Yeah, what was the proposal? Um, it's 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 a flat proposal this year, and um, you know, continuing to keep a fair amount of that in the capital bill, and I you know I would strongly. Uh, urge the committee to consider a recommendation that gets us back up to full statutory, not that far away. Um, you know, but it's, we need, I think the idea of just we're coming back to this idea of full statutory funding is good. I also want, I think there's an, there ends up being an enduring issue in having some of that funding coming through the capital bill, bill versus through the property transfer tax in the way that it was meant to. So uh, VHCC is going to be really focused on that this year, and we'll be talking yeah. a lot about it. Um, and Bob, you know, we've had some conversations about this. It's, a, it's kind of a technical issue in a way, but it has some impacts, and, and we'd love to see the intent of this of this legislation be followed through on by returning that to the, to the original source of funding that was supposed to come from. So, talking about trails, I when I was absent, I was upstairs in uh, Kingdom Trails over in yeah. St. J area. It, they have, I think, the ladies said they have trails on 80 or 90 private property parcels and they've been having to go through at 250 to put a trail. You know, private property owners aren't letting them cross when they have to go through 250. And yeah, it really, I mean, we work our butts off encouraging all these healthy living styles. And then we go and zap it with, with a regulation that, oh yeah, you can go ahead and do this and it's the greatest thing, but you gotta jump through all these hoops to get there. And, and what's happening is that the private landowners are saying, hey, I'm not gonna go through that hassle. And so what, what we ought to do somehow is set up a system where you go through forest and parks. That forest and parks recreational section could just as well manage the, the trail parks 
and and get away from those heavy regulators to uh, to do it because what's happening is, like I said, private landowners aren't aren't donating that right away in that parcel, and it's creating ball. You get to this point, and then you're done. So, you know, and it's it's good. To, I mean, about every issue we've ever dealt with on on recreation, we've always tried to work trails into it uh, on some of the easements and things. Any other? Sorry, yeah, that's an important issue as well. Have you guys bumped into that, any of you, on your foot trails? Not to the point where it triggers Act 250. You are? Um, no, because I think the, the, the models, is, I think it's a little different when you're giving the public access to your property versus charging people to use the property. The, the other thing was that um, the, the, the local commission in the kingdom had a interpretation of when Act 250 applied that was different than what the Environmental Board. I, I, so I, I'm hopeful that it's been a little smoother in the last couple of years. We heard a lot about this on the study committee that went all around the state oh, I was part of and, and it was not being at, uh, properly applied and looping in too many people, particularly in the trail discussion. Mm -hmm. um, so hopefully that's a little better now. How is the how are the bass trails uh, managed? Are they managed through parks and the They're not because they're not <laughs> permanent, right? Because they, they depend uh, on frozen land, okay. so it's sort of just it's across. Mm -hmm. So it's a different thing. Okay. That's a good question. I will say um, that you know, kind of echoing echoing Richard and. Um, uh, Shannon's point, excuse me, <laughs> sorry. I had that all teed up and I was like, I just lost it there. <laughs> um, is, yeah, the community is so grateful to be adjacent to a, to a piece of conserved land. And like in Justin's situation where I can't imagine that any one of those houses isn't so grateful mm -hmm. to have their front yard protected. You know, and um, just about every time I drive past the piece that we conserved um, by exit four, there's somebody out there doing something, walking around, snowshoeing, we're good dog, whatever. So they get a great deal of, the public gets a great, great deal of use of it. Yeah. Great, thank you so much. Yeah. 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 Yeah.